Hi, everybody, and welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, UTSA's neuroscience research podcast. Today is September 21st, 2023, and we're talking with Tiani Mao, whose official title is scientist at the Ballum Institute at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland. I think it is great that they use uh, such a descriptive title, but I think scientist is about the equivalent of professor, like assistant professor, is like assistant scientist, and so on. So um, just to get that straight, <laughs> she's a pioneer in the use of genetic tools for identifying cell types in the brain, for detecting particular intracellular molecules like cyclic AMP or PKA or their changes over time during behavior, for mapping out circuits and circuit interactions among brain regions, and even defining what the brain regions really are, the basis of their connectivity. And the brain regions she's focused on are the thalamus and cerebral cortex and basal ganglia, and there may be others that I just don't know about. Diani was here in September 2009. That's almost exactly 14 years ago, yeah. this September. And if anyone's interested in hearing that podcast, it's episode 35. And I recommend it. I listened to it last night. And uh, at that time, she was just leaving her postdoc at HHMI, Genalia Laboratory, to take her new position at the ball. Um, hi, Tiani. It's great to have you back. Hi. Good to be back. And also joining us today is James Jones, who's a PhD student at UTSA and is getting to be a podcast regular. Hi, James. Hi, everyone. And me, I'm Charlie Wilson. So, Tiani, I was going over some of your work, and the thing that strikes me about it is that there's a sort of a particular style. I think one of the worst things about it Things that's been holding neuroscience back the most is the fact that it's such hard work to get a little bit of data about a neuron. We get one, we record from one neuron, we work really hard to get our data, we get a small sample of neurons. People often have 10 or 20 sample cells in a sample of neurons of some type, or we're studying some uh, brain region and we look at it relatively in a relatively limited way and we try to extract the maximum benefit out of it. But there's always a problem that we never have very much of anything. We don't have many replications of anything we do. And uh, what hits me about your work is that you've overcome that. You've used the most modern tools that have become available in the last 14 years or so to, to collect vast amounts of information about neurons or about synapses or about even brain regions and the connectivity between brain regions, the same things that people collected before, just a much larger volume that allows you to do quantitative analysis and then look for categories where people imagined categories before and uh, strict boundaries between cell types or brain regions where we had basically just hoped there were strict boundaries. So, uh, so, so tell us something about yeah. that, about that approach. Yeah, 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 yeah. So initially, I would say when we started getting connectivity at large scale, um, it was really benefit of kind of naiveness, not knowing how hard this work would be. So um, um, I was trained first as a graduate student, as a genetist, like fly genetist, and uh, my second mentor, Soboda, was really imaging physiology. But what I got from both of them is that if you get into something, you have to do it right. So we told, I told the students how I get into Connecton is that we initially were only looking for thalamic inputs to motor cortex specifically, but we run into not repeatable experiments because we keep being uh, mess around in a boundary of different domains. So we decided to do it systematically and do it right without knowing how hard things would be. But luckily, sometimes you need that. By the time a large-scale microscopy, the scanning microscopy become available. So not just like the uh, scan imaging, uh, the uh, scanner we were using, uh, Allen Institute and Coast and Harbor, multiple institutes start having that capability of using large-scale. So we thought the unique niche for us is that we are not only generate the large data, 
where the users, where the biologists to that gonna extract something useful from. I think that's really distinguished us from many of the large scale data. Most often the people who generate data and people who try to understand the biology are separated. We are, we have the questions then we realize only the large scale comprehensive quantitative approach will allow us to ping the properties we are looking for. For example, we talked about some unpublished data today. We collected 1,500 um, uh, cells that we recorded from reconstructed. Only when we reach that level, we, uh, we can calculate or do simulation whether we have sampled every type that's possible. Um, so uh, that approach is really uh, sort of started as my lack of experience as a system professor. But when we did it first round, we realized such rich uh, data set will really allow long-term investigation into um, this circuit so much better than every doing, everybody doing pieces of it. But we did it one round, one condition very comparable across the modality. That's another kind of benefit being a postdoc engineer where, you know, we um, did the teamwork to generate GCAP, but the reason that could work is that uh, we started with the platform we know a match to the outcome, but also uh, need certain level of commitment to get into the system consistency into that. And I benefit from those experience, like so I was not afraid of failure, but we need to really get onto the good readout or the um, relevant readout then we can put into the resource. That, that's how I kind of get into this approach. Um, initially, it was hard to set the, the, the pipeline, but as soon as we did, we look at the outcome. I talked to people in the lab that we could uh, dive into specific data under this umbrella so much better than this data is generated sort of unrelevant to us. So we know exactly the question to come in. So now it becomes sort of my way of approaching the question that um, I use the analogous as genetic screen. So we are doing screen of the circuits. The, the mesoscale like anatomical projections that you've done, my understanding is that in the past when people have done more bulk types of staining, they, um, it's caused some confusion because you pick up axons of passage or et cetera. And that uh, the solution to that then was to fill single neurons and look at their axons. But of course that prevented like um, the larger scale view. Uh, what about the, the tools that you were using at that time allowed us to overcome that? You mentioned like you had to maybe figure out the right parameters for the injections mm -hmm. and stuff. And, and that the genetic specificity helped, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a yeah. little bit. Yeah, so um, there are two components to that. One is that uh, we talk about anatomical connection, right? You do tracing studies, you inject in the, your target area, you look at where the axons go, but oftentimes um, you will see the axons coming to a neighborhood, but it does not make synaptic connections to every cell in that neighborhood. So I, I, I view the, this kind of tracing as the first pass of the upper ceiling what's possible, but within that, if you uh, you really need to use other functional tools to mm. uh, validate. So the approach we took is that uh, as a postdoc, I um, teamed up with uh, uh, my former colleagues to uh, establish the technology like um, channel adoption assisted circuit mapping, where we can rapidly, the keyword is rapid, fast enough to allow us to large scale. So every single anatomical projections we describe in the mesoscopic connectome, we have by far validated all of them with synaptic uh, recordings with channel adoption stimulation. And we found a huge, actually sometimes surprise specificity, different cell type in the target area could even like totally not receiving the inputs from the, uh, the track we described for majority of the pyramidal neurons that we publish, we validate every single one. So just to 
uh, thinking about th these brain regions, I mean, I guess in the very beginning of neuroanatomy, neuroanatomists decided every neuron in the brain belongs to some specific region and one region only. And then every region has a set of neurons, and then there's a boundary, and the neurons across that boundary belong to some other region. And that wasn't based on knowledge that it had to be like that. It was mostly based on an assumption because if it isn't like that, we're lost, and we're not going to be able to figure out the anatomy of the brain. But at this point, it's possible to test that using connections because and using other methods for determining cell types. So uh, in the end, does it turn out to be true that brain regions are like contiguous groups of neurons that don't interleave with other nearby brain regions and have nice sharp boundaries. And we can really say this neuron belongs to that nucleus and not that. And there's no neurons that they're halfway in between mm -hmm. two nuclei. Or what's in the thalamus, say, where this is, so, you have solid data. Or in the cerebral cortex, where the boundaries between cortical regions are hard to see for the untrained eye and maybe could even be partly imagined by the trained eye. Mm. Yeah, so let's get back to the questions, how you define a brain region? What is the brain region? Um, then uh, different species, is that really, you know, our definition of brain region uh, conserved? Because we are a lot of time using circular analogous from mice we get into primates and humans. So I my take are, uh, on this uh, two parts. Number one is that in, for example, a cortical area, people could do functional experiments like I'm stimulating whisker. I know this part responded to that sensory stimulation, so that belongs to the whisker uh, primary uh, somatosensory. And if I'm giving visual stimulation, I know where V1 is, I know where A1 is. Um, but if you look at the thalamus, originally this uh, uh, nuclei were defined by cytoarchitecture criteria in primates and cats, where you um, slice those brains, you see beautiful boundaries. I think it's really getting to rodents and then these boundaries uh, become uh, mixed. So the question is how we uh, define those functionally relevant thalamic nuclei. There are tremendous work for decades have uh, get on this question. But even now we are looking at whether I quoted the Marie Sherman's uh, from my talk is whether individual nuclei that's defined by cytoarchitecture criteria still stands for functional genetic connectivity um, criteria. So um, we had an effort trying to make this um, biased quantitative description um, purely by the structure where the particular position of nuclei locating the thalamus. But I think down the road, what's missing and what's really will be important is genetic definition together with anatomy. Um, can we find uh, genetic markers that allow us to go back to the same exactly area? It doesn't matter how initially it was defined, but if it can repeat across the animal, across the behavior modality. So there was great effort from, uh, for example, Adam Hartman's uh, lab when he was in Jamelia recently moved and they try to um, do transcriptomic work to identify that. But we're still very far from really define the nuclei or even relative position of the nuclei in a very repeatable uh, cross modality way that we can go back saying this marker allow us to activate this or access this group of cell. But I feel like cortical area to this question or um, for example, stratum is a little bit different. In the stratum, when we use the excitatory inputs, um, it's actually uh, correlate well with what people roughly know, dorsal medial, dorsal lateral, ventral versus uh, medial, uh, ventral and lateral ventral, uh, it's correlated really great with behavior using purely connectivity. And then on top of that, there are beautiful molecular markers in the stratum. So that's why I feel like the access there with genetic anatomy circuit is so cohesive. And that's the challenge in the thalamus, like how we can get cohesive multimodal definition of cell types in there uh, in their uh, defined region. But cortical area, I think it's a different type of challenge. People can argue pyramidal neuron, every pyramidal neuron is a type of its own because it's different from the neighbor. 
Mm. Um, so we are trying to use, or the field have been great with using transcriptomic morphology, including dendrite and axons, and um, also the physiology properties. Uh, right now with some uh, associate area, we try to add local connectivity onto um, this. And then in the future, to your question, will be really great and important to compare different cortical regions with the cell types people identified and we identified or as the uh, whole field are the cell types in one cortical area versus the cell type in another cortical area in the pyramidal neuron. How similar are they? Are there any evolutionary component uh, to that? So, so can you, uh, but I think uh, part of the, the question in the thalamus is, because in the thalamus, the nuclei, as we understand them, sometimes there's a nucleus that's, that projects an auditory cortex. Mm -hmm. It's right up to a nucleus that doesn't project the auditory mm -hmm. cortex. And we see right here there's a boundary. But the boundary is approximate as we're looking at it. And I'm wondering if we, if we could follow along, and I think you can in your data, at high resolution, walking along from one nucleus into the other, whether we go through a place where there's a sharp boundary and the connections change, or a place where there's shared projections, where the neurons on the boundary are projecting to both places. Which is it? Um, I'll give you a good example, the, the example I know the best. So that's what driven this project. Initially, when uh, during my postdoc work, I looked at the sensory cortex and motor cortex connections. We found that sensory cortex input actually do not go to layer 5B cells where uh, cortical pyramidal cells located. So I was being searching, I was searching for a thalamic area that's going to drive uh, the deep layer in the uh, motor cortex. During this search, we found that actually there are sharp boundaries. I had my first rotation student trying to stimulate uh, from there, and we got drastically different results from individual animal. And that's what uh, encouraged us to actually look at the bigger picture, and that's where this connectome project projects were originated. What we found after we've done hundreds of injections, we summarize with some of the injections that do project to layer 5B and some of the ones that don't. And we can see these two domains are right neighbor to each other. The reason we were having problem were we were targeting the boundary area. So one day we are a little bit in the uh, 5B domain and the next day we were not. So I can give you at least one example. There are sharp boundaries and the, the boundaries are not regular shape and it's including many more nuclei than we originally thought. So uh, those are examples for the sharp boundaries, but also after we analyzed the whole thalamocortical projection, we saw some of them actually have much more uh, uh, murky or like really no boundaries from the domains people are talking about. So both the examples exist. And on top of that, we also found examples and then uh, work from Bernardo Salvatini's lab have also shown that in some of the nuclei, you can actually stop dividing it. For example, PF uh, and MD thalamus, we now see a very interesting sub-nuclei um, separation, both from a circuit point of view, behavior point of view, and depending on the behavior you're looking at, we see anterior MD or medial MD, uh, totally different function, and with PF as well. So uh, this boundary, um, as people thought, the thalamic nuclei was the individual unit. This, as uh, Marie has been put in the book, has been challenged, and um, but which one is the case, I think, both exist. So this back to a more conceptual or philosophy, philosophical concept are those cytoarchitecture, the brain sets up, how much of them actually is the functional unit based on histology point of view. Um, because cytoarchitectonics is a little bit artificial. We stain the cell bodies and mm -hmm. nuclei of cells, and then we stand back and we say, well, the texture here looks a little different from the texture there. It's not like the, 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 the drawings have mm -hmm. nice 
sharp lines between mm-hmm. them, but the mm-hmm. pictures don't. No, so that's part of your absolutely right. Whereas connectivity may actually observe this imaginary line. Yeah, so that's where, like, for example, when we define dorsal medial versus dorsal lateral uh, stratum, the connectivity map allow us to draw the sharp line. And we can even calculate how forgiven this line is by looking at the jitter or the uh, uh, statistic confidence of the uh, connectivity map. On the other hand, I was thinking uh, your comments to the, um, the, the histology cortical layers it's beautifully uh separate you know the units different layers are doing different things so um are the, oftentimes are they correlation or are they like uh, really made in a structure that allow us to compute in different brain region differently i think both examples exist yeah. and but thalamus is an amazing place to look at it because it's so complicated but most importantly, it's so functional relevant. People have long been, uh, you know, there were debate about whether they are just relay, and we knew that this is not the case. Thalamus is really integrating so many uh, different information within the thalamus, but how this uh, tens of nuclei doing it differently. Right. So I think uh, I'm hoping um, genetic tools will allow us to get better access. Then we can combine the connectivity maps we generated now to uh, together address those questions. But the thalamus isn't a place for cross-modal integration very much. Uh, so when people say integration, they mean lots of different kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But the idea that visual part of thalamus connects to auditory part of thalamus and you produces some kind of thalamic joint signal. Mm -hmm. That's what we think doesn't happen in the thalamus. It seems to me that your work reinforces that view of the thalamus. Yes, I think from connectivity point of view, uh, definitely. Um, It's really like also the question was, you know, this compartmentalization within thalamus, how much we looked at a lot of cortical, cortical interaction very thoroughly in, you know, uh, as the field. But I just uh, think within the thalamus, how different nuclei actually interact with each other if they are a bit far away. Um, that's still not like we were, we talked about using LSPS technique to systematically looking at different nuclei, potentially functional relevant, but never uh, get that far. But mostly people have looked from thalamus to cortical. Um, that input is so critical for any of our sensory processing, and that's being looked at very uh, extensively. So uh, say a little something about that trick that made it possible to get high resolution in the thalamus, mm-hmm. because axonal tracing has been used for a long time to try to figure out what projections of thalamus are. and What's the hang-up, and how did you fix it? Um, yeah, so, you know, viral injection with our current technique, most of often, even we do smallest uh, possible 10 nanoliter, 5 to 10 nanoliter, which is the minimal that will give you a very uh, consistent uh, infection. Um, but even that, the spread of the virus is about 500 micron. So the this size of the injection is way above many the size of many of the nuclei or even uh, many uh, small uh, brain regions. So if you, if you look at a lot of papers, people show you like I'm targeting uh, small brain regions with viral injection, but they don't show you the sections before and after this actually expand very big. So particularly for thalamus, we realized very early that using current technology of tracers, either uh, uh, organic beads or the virus, the spread will be way bigger than the size of many of the nuclei. And the shape is weird, all the nuclei, it's not like a ball, but your injection is like a ball. How can you sample that? So at the time I was leaving Genelia, Eric Betzik just you know, had his uh, super resolution microscopy. I was like, wait a second, can we gain some resolution by using higher sampling rate? It's exactly the same idea imaging people are using. So that's where we uh, sample many of these thalamic nuclei 
20, 30 times and allow us to sum the uh, injections or subtract the injections that don't project to the target, so then uh, this uh, negative projection results I talked about. So this literally um, give us much, much higher resolution and then we can start quantitatively analyzing some small nuclei. So if you do sparse injections in the thalamic area, you never would be able to get that kind of resolution. So I think that's really a little bit the, the trick or the advantage we have uh, coming from the view of how would we um, collect the data and then the analysis and allow us to gain so much better resolution compared to what people typically do with fire injections. I guess there's really two reasons that hasn't been done a lot before. And one of them is you just had to make a lot of injections and it's a lot of work. Yes. And you have to reconstruct the axonal projections that go a long way and go into the cortex and the reconstruction job is really huge. Yeah. And then finally you had to do that combinatorics to pull out the high resolution image from that. So that's it's just the volume of it is what I think has been Prohibiting people yeah. from doing it. Yeah, and also um, previous generation of anatomists didn't have the luxury uh, thing we had. Now it's to, you know, four hours you can get a whole brain. And there are current technology can even make that better. You know, we are using brain clearly. You don't have to section. But still, what the challenges you talked about still real. Like um, now you don't have to section, but you still need to understand the pieces of those axon tracks. How do you interpret that? For example, viral injection tools is so much depending on the expression of the fluorophore. Every animal, that expression is different. How do you handle that, right? So how do we normalize it to the expression? And you let the virus go longer time, it's more, shorter time, it's less. So your fluorescence intensity is really not the indication of the strength. So we came up with analysis that allow us to look at the presence of the um, the, the fluorescence, like how dense is the axons getting there. But what's lacking in the current most of the, this type of work is that um, you cannot, because it's not the single cell, you don't get to appreciate different type of bootons. Yeah. So to do that, uh, really single cell reconstruction is needed. Um, for our, our estimation, that's level or scale of the work only Genelia or Allen Institute can do, not to an individual lab's task, but the reason we choose to do mesoscopic is by design, which I called, I called um, operational resolution because you can get beautiful single cell reconstruction, get you a lot of information. But for us, our goal is to get to behavior. You can never manipulate single bouton, single axon, uh, or single cell to get a behavior. So I feel like mesoscopic uh, connectome is a kind of sweet spot for the current um, effort to link to the behavior because as soon as I see these um, projections, I can go there and target and manipulate and see what's the behavior outcome. So that's by design we went to this uh, resolution. And we knew there in the future, the higher resolution will be needed for different type of questions. So I guess the final like confirmation of a connection is you stimulate the axon and it produces a current in the next neuron. And for me, one of the cool things in one of your papers was the connection from the sensory to motor cortices. And whenever I look at layer 5A and 5B, I know that people say those are different layers. I don't study cortex. So maybe I don't have as trained an eye. It's hard to see that difference. And both of those neurons have... Uh, axons from sensory cortex overlap between them, and you found that the whenever you stimulated those axons, despite them overlapping, they only made functional inputs onto one type. Is that the is that the final call? And then I guess uh, thinking back to the thalamus, do those different regions that you've kind of confirmed now do those get different inputs as well? Have you guys? Looked at that at all? Is you there? You mean the upstream of the thalamic? Uh, I guess down. 
downstream. Yeah, up, upstream, yes. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So like what's even driving the... Yes. So I can unpack it, that question a little bit. Yeah. If you ask, depending on who you ask, whether that's the final call, if you ask people like uh, Jeff Littemann, we we need to have the uh, EM of the whole mouth spring to really uh, say these are the synaptic mm. in, in, in a, you know, comprehensive manner. But here, what the, the data you referred to uh, in our earlier paper is that what it says that um, although axons coming at the mesoscopic level into the area, there is still a lot of specificity sure. embedded. So we calculated the predicted uh, connectivity based on the axons and the dendrite morphology and their overlap. Mm. And then recorded from the experimental one, then we compare this. So you could see some cells, this uh, uh, prediction fulfills. You do see the predicted inputs, but there were uh, surprises that uh, you either have very little inputs in the area that's fully being surrounded by massive thonic axons. Mm. So I think the work will come to uh, uh, look back to Charlie's question. That's where your postsynaptic cell type would matter. Your inputs come to this area, but how does it sort out and process locally? Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, 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 again, this give you the possibility, but would that possibility being realized in this particular cell type? I think that has to be tested really one by one. Again, to our approach has to be comprehensive. Like if we know, uh, for example, I mentioned that 22 different cell types in the insular cortex, then you have to test every, all these cell types in receiving the inputs from thalamus. Where are the a specificity line from. Uh, in a sensory motor case, we we're lucky that 5A and 5B were different, but if yeah. they were in the same layer, you don't have a molecular marker um, for it. So, mm -hmm. I, um, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of sort of hidden structure in that yeah. microscopic mm -hmm. view of connectivity. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like recapitulating the history of neuroanatomy. You know, people just started saying, let's make a map of what each nucleus projects to what nucleus, mm -hmm. and we'll worry about the substructure of it, how many different cell types mm -hmm. there are, and whether different cell types project to different targets, or whether there's just one cell type. There's a lot of complexity that isn't evident at that level. Mm -hmm. But until you know that level, you those other questions sort of don't come up. They don't have any meaning. Right, right. And, and, and at one time, I think people thought, well, we know that level now. We have that the connections between the brain roughly, and we teach it in our anatomy class to every medical student and so on. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that what we had was just the tip of the iceberg of the connectivity of the brain. It was limited by the techniques that were in use, and it was especially limited by that belief that we were done. Mm. Because once you think you're done, you quit looking. And, it, and so... Uh, somebody comes along and starts looking again, and suddenly you start seeing that there's a, a lot more there. And we had to wait for, I guess, the technology to be mm -hmm. right. And then people had the, the courage to do the large scale experiment that people that we've all shied away from these big experiments. I mean, you mentioned, and we don't have time to talk about it, I guess, but you recorded 1,500 neurons in the insular cortex, reconstructed them all, measured their responses to current mm -hmm. pulses and where they are and, and what inputs they get and all of that stuff. And that, of course, that's what we need to have. But we all, and everybody knew that. We just thought, you can't do that. But you can't. Yes, yeah, sometimes uh, you have a few determined students. I told them the reconstruction is mostly happening in the garage of this RA's uh, parents because he joined uh, February 2020. Um, perfect timing for the lab to be shut down in the uh, uh, next couple of months. So we smuggled the microscope out of the building and re-put it in the garage of his parents. Uh, he reconstructed most of them during pandemic as a new student who didn't do any of this before. What a great project for a new student during the pandemic. Most yeah. of the students were stuck not making any progress at all. <laughs> I was the luckiest student <laughs> in the whole pandemic. Yeah. And we won't tell anybody you smuggled it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that's amazing. That was a great story. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, I know. Thank you for coming back. It's great to see you. Thank you you so much for having me. I really enjoy this visit, and we can always keep having this conversation. And I'm looking forward to, you know, re catch up with you guys maybe another 10 years. We won't (laughs) wait that long. And thanks, James. Thank you. This has been your Scientist Talk Shop. Thank you.